leading off will be Henry Aaron, a.k.a. Hank Aaron. He is the Virginian Bruce McLowry Senior Fellow at the Brookings. He's been a noted and well-regarded health policy analyst for many years and brings not only that position as someone who has written, thought, and counseled others for many years, but has served himself in the past as Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. So with that wide experience, Hank, let me invite you to be first. Uh, I'd like to uh, start off with something akin to the cliff notes for health reform. Uh, but before getting into that, uh, observe that I think there was one sentence in President Obama's speech to the joint session of Congress which was about as clearly wrong as uh, any president has ever said, and that was that he, he thought that if we succeeded with health care reform legislation, he would be the last president uh, for whom this would be a major issue. I think the uh, more correct observation would be that uh, if he succeeds, uh, he will be the first in a long line of presidents who will be introducing legislation on health reform, probably for as long as anybody in this room is alive. The reason for that uh, is that uh, the industry is huge. If we got it right the first time, it would be nothing short of miraculous. We will make mistakes, whatever we do. Uh, and I think by far and away the most important issue is not so much what we do, but that we do something, that we move off dead center on the issue of health reform. So uh, with that as uh, background, I'm going to start also with the public option and provide a basis for what I'm sure will be disagreement within the panel by saying that I think this has been a monumentally overhyped issue both by advocates uh, and opponents. The reason I say it is not because a public option doesn't have within it the potential to be a game changer, but because given Congress's fundamentally small c a conservative attitude toward preserving the interests of major constituencies, the chance that a public option would be allowed in a major way to erode the position of private insurance companies in the health insurance business is close to zero. With that constraint, if one accepts that constraint, then the fears of the opponents of the public option are grossly overblown and the hopes of the advocates of the public option will, in my view, not be realized. The second issue are the subsidies necessary to make an individual mandate affordable. Uh, how deep are they? That depends on the question of how uh, complete the coverage that's mandated actually is. The major bills in both the House and the Senate, uh, draft bills, uh, all contain uh, plans of varying degrees of generosity measured by their actuarial value, uh, and the mandates differ depending on where a person is on the income scale. Um, the uh, differences among the bills in the generosity of coverage and in what individuals are expected to pay is huge, and this issue is of critical substantive importance. Just as an example, if you're just above the poverty threshold, the premiums required under the Senate Finance Committee bill are nearly five times as large as those in the first drafted Senate Health Education Labor and Pension Committee bill, and more than three times larger than those of the subsequently drafted House bill, um, so-called H.R. 3200. Um, the generosity of the insurance that would be bought for the higher premiums in the Baucus bill is significantly lower, uh, covering a smaller fraction of expected health care spending. As you move up the income scale, the uh, S Senator Baucus's bill quits earlier at 300 percent of poverty, and it does so with higher premiums and a lower level of insurance coverage than in the other two bills. That's one of the reasons why the Senate bill appears to be 
uh, less expensive uh, than uh, the earlier Senate bill or the uh, House drafted, uh, House committee drafted bill. Let me turn to issue three. What do you do with employers? There are two questions here. Uh, which businesses do you exempt? Uh, how large uh, are the companies that don't have to provide some kind of a contribution to health insurance on behalf of their employees? And if a company is large enough to be subject to a requirement, how large are the penalties imposed if they don't provide acceptable health insurance to their employees? Uh, the first issue, uh, to put it crudely, determines uh, how the various small business organizations will respond to this bill. And the second issue has a big effect on what the net cost in terms of required tax increases or spending cuts to pay for the bill. Issue four are the exchanges. What are the rules they are required, are empowered to enforce, uh, and how are they organized? 